We're going to start a new series. It's called Deliver Us. Here's, we got, we got, uh, we're interrupting the um, plan because in the midst of the last several weeks, there was just a clear sense that we need to equip this community for the um, engagement in spiritual warfare as discipleship. So we're going to talk about spiritual warfare. We're going to talk about the ministry of Jesus as one of deliverance. We're going to do some prayer training on deliverance. Alex and Hannah Absalom are going to lead that in a couple of weeks. Um, But in the midst of all the things that are going on, there's just this heightened sense of unity in our leadership that this is what we need to lead you into this next season. Um, Oddly enough, I had planned on doing it six months ago, but then I, I got chicken and felt like, why would I want to mess around with talking about uh, Satan and the problem of evil and warfare? Because that's, that's basically a bullseye. Um, but then I got courage a couple weeks ago because you guys interceded for us. And you stepped in. And, and I just feel like, let's go for it. Yeah, buckle up. Um, so before I pray, I just want to recognize today's September 11th, the 21st anniversary of that tragic day where many Americans lost their lives and First responders uh, res- responded to a crisis and ran towards the danger. And I recognize that as a nation, this is a national tragedy, that for some of us, even in our community, there's a lot of personal stories of loss and grief. And so I just want to honor that in the midst of this. So I want to lead us in prayer um, before we start this moment. But I just recognize that we still live in a world where there's terrorism, there's hate, there's uh, injustice, and there's... Um, evil that is working itself out every single day. And if you're a Christian or or non-Christian, I just need you to know that was never God's desire. That's not God's will. That's not God's plan. Um, So we're going to confront that theology today. But let's pray together, right? So Father, we ask that you would comfort our brothers and sisters around the world that are grieving today uniquely. Um, I pray, Jesus, that you would meet them in their grief and the loss. Lord, as a nation, we just want to honor um, those lives that have been lost and those that are, have served uh, in those situations and at their own cost of life. And so, Lord, we bless you. We pray protection over our country. We pray protection for anyone anywhere that's oppressed, anyone anywhere that's experiencing anything other than your heaven on earth. So we pray in the words of Jesus, your kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus, I pray today in faith that you would uh, protect the church, that you would send angels to guard against us as we begin to recognize the whole ministry of Jesus. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, it says this, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And that lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is Jesus' famous prayer uh, called the Lord's Prayer where it's the only time a disciple or disciples ask him, and they do this in the Gospel of Luke, teach us how to pray. That's the only thing we know that his disciples ask Jesus to show them how to do what he does. And he says this prayer, and it's a different version in Luke, but in this prayer, we get a theology of Jesus' thinking. He says the goal is that God be glorified, his holy name would be known on earth. And then he says, your kingdom, which we've talked about the kingdom of God more more here than any other church I've been a part of, but that's because it's talked about more than anything else in all of the gospels. Jesus Preach the kingdom of, God, uh, kingdom of God is at hand. God's way of life, God's reality on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus says, he, he says, as we begin to engage in the battle cry, because to announce God's kingdom advancement is to also announce the, the battle against the kingdom of darkness. And he says, God's kingdom come and will be done. That implies there are places on this earth where God's way of life, his will is not yet realized. So we partner with him in prayer. But then at the end, it gets to this part where it says, deliver us from the evil one is the best translation of the Lord's prayer. Deliver us from Satan. 
deliver us from the kingdom of darkness, deliver us from the active beings and culture of darkness working against us as followers of Jesus. This is the Lord's Prayer. I've taught my kids to pray. They have it memorized. But as Christians, are we even aware of the supernatural or spiritual warfare that's going on in the ministry of Jesus? And therefore, we are invited into as followers of Jesus today. Remember, we are called as disciples to be with Jesus, become like him, and to do the things that Jesus did. If you go and look throughout the, the Gospels and the New Testament, you will see a, 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 a focus on spiritual warfare if you pay attention. So over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about this stuff. Today, I have one task. But before that, let me just give you um, the, the, the Apostle John. He summarizes the work of Jesus in his epistle. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Look what he says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. This is John's summary of the ministry of Jesus. And it gets you thinking, in our westernized culture, have we kind of made Jesus a nice cozy teacher who affirms our consuming lifestyle, our basically secular lifestyle, or do we recognize that he, is, he has come and is here and will continue to reign until the end of the suffering and the spaces that are contested by evil are resolved once and for all. We have an enemy waging war against our lives and against God's desire for humanity. And wherever the kingdom of God is breaking forth, the kingdom of darkness is at work and around. And so as we, over the last 12, 13 years as a church, have confronted cultural idols and as we call out the complacency of the American church, we are at the same time disrupting the evil that's at work against God's way of life. So we are starting this series with an awareness that what we need most of all is a biblical worldview for how to engage the world around us. So today I want to give you what I see from scripture as a biblical worldview for all Christians, and that is simply a spiritual warfare worldview. It's in Western context that we struggle with this. If you go to places like Africa or throughout countries in Asia or Latin America and South America, they have no problem recognizing the kind of evil and supernatural activity that's in the world. We live in a context where we have to overcome some Western worldview obstacles to embrace the spiritual warfare worldview because our perspective is everything. Let me just give you a little bit of history real quick. We live in the Western context. And what, we, what we've done since the beginning of the 18th century in the Enlightenment and rationalistic and scientific worldview is assumed there's no reality beyond the natural and material universe. What we've done kind of grown over the last two year, 200 years from is this perspective that if it cannot be measured or observed in a laboratory, it must not exist. So this materialistic worldview has affected Western Christianity, specifically in regards to the work of the supernatural. So we approach things of the spirit or the supernatural world around us with skepticism, especially when talking about spiritual gifts, or the angelic beings or demons in Western context. In fact, I've traveled all over the world teaching about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I will say it is the Christian who is most opposed to the ministry of this Holy Spirit. Everywhere I go, they're like, they're, they're, they're the ones that don't believe in it. But I have to say, Western context has influenced Christians more than anyone else. I want to, I want to, keep going on this and I'm going to make a little disclaimer because I actually have, there's a fascinating thing happening in Western culture right in this moment. But what we come out of as the church is this uh, Western worldview. I love what Charles Kraft said. He, he says, it is interesting and discouraging to note that even though we are Christians, our basic assumptions are usually mo uh, more like those of non-Christian Westerners around us than we would like to admit. Even though there is a wide discrepancy between the teachings of Scripture and the common Western assumptions, we often find ourselves more Western than scriptural. 
Western societies passed through Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and a wide variety of ripples and spinoffs from these movements. The result, God and the church were dethroned and the human mind came to be seen as savior. It is ignorance, not Satan, we are to fight. I believe most Christians live secular lives. There's little power in our prayers, power in transformation. Most Christians hold to a cultural fraternity version of Christianity rather than embrace Jesus as Lord of my life and live the entire life. In response to that, we make Christianity comfortable to fit our worldview. This has come out of the 1800s. We see the death or the, the, the end of the expectation of the supernatural way of Jesus to be ordinary in Christians' lives. We just assume it doesn't happen anymore because it died out with the apostolic age, let alone the idea of angels. Brothers and sisters, if we don't have dreams or angels, we wouldn't have Mary giving birth to Jesus. Joseph taking her as his wife. We, we, would have, we wouldn't have um, Gentiles in the Christian faith. It was Peter on top of a, uh, uh, eat, uh, on top, uh, Peter was on top of a house and he has a vision from the Lord. And then another guy has a visitation by an angel and he calls for Peter to go to his house. We are here because of the Acts 10 moment. Angels and visions were part of this story. Obviously, I believe the word, Jesus himself, is the greatest revelation of God. And we have the written word, which is the word we fall back to, but God still speaks today. He still speaks prophetically. He still has angels operating. If our eyes were to see the unseen realm, which by the way, that's the name of a book I highly recommend, yeah, the unseen realm, we would be exposed to realities beyond our comprehension. Some of us have walked into rooms and we feel stuff residue of evil. We don't, wouldn't say that. We'd say, I'm, I'm intuitive. Or you're discerning evil spirits. Some of us discern angels. We've had, I know people that have had angelic visitations. I've had lots of run-ins with demonic, I'll tell you that. I wish I had the good ones. <laughs> I've had lots from when I was a kid until later in life. I mean, I've... It's, it's crazy how much I've had to deal with. And, and now I just, I'm just so used to it. I'm not, I'm not naive to this reality. And I don't think we should be um, unaware of these things. I think so many of us hold on to a life that's more secular. I'm going to skip a couple of great quotes. One's from C.S. Lewis. One's from Francis McNutt. But the point I want to make for the sake of time is that ma the materialist Western worldview is playing out in Christianity. And so if we're going to be discipled into the way of Jesus, we have to adopt, write this down, a spiritual warfare worldview. If you do not believe in spiritual warfare or God's activity, then you don't put much thought into it in general. And most of Christianity doesn't. And let me say what happens. What, what, when you don't think about the spiritual realities that are happening around us, then you will largely base your Christianity on cultural or social momentum or political momentum. So your expression of Christianity is simply validated through cultural wins, political wins, or social action. Rather than recognizing something is going on behind the scenes of life, which I'll talk about in a second. So spiritual warfare assumes there is a cosmic spiritual battle going on. There are invisible spiritual beings and forces that op oppose God's activity in God's kingdom. So I'm going to give you a quick survey of the Old and New Testament. So here we go. Stay with me. I want to just give you a general overview. I'm going to give you a more of a professor talk today. So put on my professorship hat. Call me Dr. Bill Doctrum. Um, <laughs> spiritual warfare, that would be an honor, but don't do that. Spiritual warfare in the Old Testament. One of the most fascinating differences between the Old and New Testament is that while there is a great deal of exorcism of evil spirits in the New Testament, there's very little, if any mentions at all, of evil spirits in the Old Testament. Nowhere in the Hebrew Old Testament does Satan appear as a distinctive demonic figure opposed to God and responsible for all evil. 
But there are all sorts of metaphors and allusions for evil and cosmic forces opposing God. The Leviathan, this idea of a cosmic warfare with raging seas, hostile environments. They are judging the gods and rebuking the adversary. Perhaps the best known mention of Satan in the Old Testament is found in Job. But even in Job, Satan is just a title, the Satan, the accuser. Furthermore, he's just part of a heavenly court, kind of like a prosecuting attorney. Now, the best illustration I have for this is from Thor, Love and Thunder. <laughs> Which if you've seen that, I'm not recommending it. But again here, oh, let me just go to this side. No, I forgot the disclaimer. There we go. I found it. Now, I've been saying we are arguing against our Western worldview shaping Christianity and the church. And I want to say that is dominant in the church. But in culture, something else is happening. So let me just say this. Let me make this point. Our Western culture, our secular view that the spiritual realm doesn't exist, God's not really active, is more dominant in the church than it is in culture today. I wouldn't have said this five, seven years ago, but I'm saying it now. Why? Stranger Things, Love and Thunder, um, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse Madness, um, Little Demon, the cartoon show. We, we are obsessed as a culture with the afterlife, with Elohims, the gods, which is what I was referring to in Love and Thunder. There's a court of the Elohims. If you read the Old Testament, if you read the book Unseen Realm, your mind's gonna be blown. But the idea that there's, there are these God-like people that have power that are gathering. And so in Job's description, it seems like there are these angelic beings that are in this court with Yahweh God. And that's like love and thunder. So they're just stealing from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. But my point about culture is this. I just want to make this clear. When I travel to churches, when I speak to Christians, when I meet new people that are coming to our church from other churches, there's this, there's this excitement about the things of the Spirit. But there's also this fear, which I understand. I'm not diminishing the fear of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's been abused. It's been abused in Western context, it's been abused in Southern California in particular. So we can't deny that. But what I keep realizing is we live our Christian faith out of fear rather than the scriptures. So we have, we're okay with powerlessness. We're okay with a non-spiritual lifestyle, a, a powerless prayers because of fear. And that's, that's not okay. When is it ever okay to live out of fear? So rooted in scripture, we have a theology of the Holy Spirit, but in culture, what I've become aware of is everyone is okay with the idea that there are supernatural things happening. It is, this, is, this is the current mindset. It wasn't like this 40 years ago. It is like that today, where we believe in darkness. We believe in spiritual powers. We believe in existence of some type of being. We do not want to call it Jesus or God. So we want the kingdom without the king. We want the benefits of chakra and tarot cards and, and we, want to, we want to go visit people that can speak to the dead and make that a popular show on Netflix. We're obsessed. We're okay with that today. We believe in that, but we don't want to go to the source, which is Jesus, who spoke life into existence. We want the power without God's presence. We want God's kingdom without God as king. That's the cultural synopsis. So with that, I, I believe that our future evangelistic opportunity is not winning people over with logical argument, it's, it's healing them. It's living as a person of peace in an anxious environment and, not, and just being a non-anxious presence. And then saying, well, I'm here not because I chant in yoga, but I'm here because Jesus gave me peace. And now we're like, oh, do I have that yet? And if you don't, this is the invitation. There's more to the way of Jesus than just reading a book. Amen. Yeah. There's more to the way of Jesus than just being good at fasting and praying and showing up to church on time. <laughs> just kidding. Serving and being a novice sound engineer. I see you. Thank you. Um. Saul in the Old Testament. So what, what do we have then when we talk about the Old Testament? Saul is tormented by evil spirits. 
1 Samuel chapter 16, it says, Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Verse, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So there's very limited Old Testament references to Satan and evil, um, but there are, these are some specific ones where we see that there is an opposing force against God's way, God's people, and God's chosen ones. So like David represents God's, God's presence to the world, and Satan inspires this idea of count your army so that you know how you can fight against the opposition versus trust the Lord and he'll provide. That's the story of First Chronicles. But then there's this really fascinating story. And this is the one that really messed me up years ago. You ready for it? I, hopefully we have a bunch of mature people. If not, there's some great books that will walk you down this path. And we're going to do this over the next few weeks. So there's a story in Daniel chapter 10. I want you to go there in your Bibles. I want you to highlight. You can start in verse 1, but we're going to speak to 12, 13. I'm just going to show you something. This, Because this, this is going to pull out some things which I'll speak to. After praying for three weeks, oh, let me say that over. So Daniel's disturbed about something and he goes to the Lord and he prays and fasts. He doesn't eat food for 21 days. All right, so just how hangry are you after 21 days? How hangry are you after seven hours? Just Let's just throw it up. An angel comes and visits Daniel and reassures Daniel that his prayer had been immediately heard by God. And he had been immediately, instantly dispatched by God to respond to Daniel. But unfortunately, God's intended quick response was significantly delayed by 21 days because of some cosmic evil power, an angelical force identified as the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So let's jump into verse 12, chapter 10. It says this, do not be afraid, Daniel. This is the angel speaking. Since the first day you set your mind to gain understanding, to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. Verse 13, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, the character we know as the archangel, one of the chief princes, so he's named as a prince in, the, in, in Daniel, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. And skip down to verse 20. So he said, do you know why I've come to you? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Okay, so there's a lot going on. I, I don't have time to get into the nuance. I'm gonna summarize this. But what you need to know is that all, most 90, the, all of the scholars I read, have no debate about what the word prince means here. They're spiritual beings who oversee various territories on earth. So that the account depicts some type of angelic battle happening behind the scenes of physical reality. So the book of Revelation in the Old Testament, the, the word revelation in Greek is the word apocalypse, which means the unveiling. So if you read Revelation, it's not this blueprint of what's about to happen. Chapter 21 and 22 are the verses about what's happened, what's going to happen. Almost all of the book of Revelation has already happened. Just so you know, that is a biblical ex exegetical way of reading Revelation as um, apocalyptic literature, which is what Daniel is, apocalyptic, all right? And what he's saying is apocalyptic, apocalypse is, is unveiling, it's opening the curtains to see what's happening in the spiritual realm. And what's the point of Revelation? It's a discipleship book. Hey, Jesus is gonna win, right? He won on the cross and he's gonna win once and for all, so keep going. That's the book, all right? Daniel gives us this revelation, this unveiling of this angelic warfare that's going on behind the scenes. All Daniel knows is he's distressed, seeking wisdom, so he fasts until he has understanding. And it doesn't come for 21 days. God, day one, dispatched his will, but it was opposed. Can we pause for a moment? This brings up a lot of questions, doesn't it? Can we just, 
because you're like, Darren, you're, you're dancing on heresy. No, I'm not. I'm being as biblical, more biblical than most people who claim to be biblical. Just because you read the Bible verse by verse on a Sunday does not make you more biblical. Just side note, okay? Are we all right? Wait, can, uh, did I offend you? What makes something biblical is not how much you read it. It's how, if you interpret it and apply it to your life, right? Like, just because I hold the Bible up here doesn't make me more biblical as a preacher. Are we all right with that? Like, I think the obsession over that, the fights that happen in only circles of Christianity are ridiculous. We're talking about applying, interpreting, ingesting, meditating, letting the word of God do something inside of you so you can't help it. I'm gonna pick some fights too. God's messenger got held up because of a spiritual battle specifically with the prince of Persia. And then the angel Michael comes. Apparently he's got some type of capacity to relieve this messenger to deliver the message and take on the fight. That's crazy talk. Am, are, anyone else? So this raises questions for me. Here are some of the questions that I have. It, all sorts of questions. It really messed me up with my theology early on. But then I came to understand, and this is what I'm presenting to you. This raises all, raises all sorts of questions about God and the way the world actually works. For example, do evil, invisible, cosmic beings really possess the power to disrupt a plan of God, specifically in answer to prayer? Can transcendent evil beings negatively affect us in a way that is similar to the, to the way people who have authority over us on earth, like princes and kings, queens, governors, presidents, and bosses, affect us? Is it really the case that whether we hear from God might have to do not only with God's will or in our faith, as we Western believers customarily assume, but with the will of various created invisible beings who exist above us and below God. How are we doing? <sighs> Daniel 10, if you read it straightforward and you understand the theology, affirms not only the existence of powerful angelic beings, but also their ability either to cooperate with or resist God's will. So this challenges many of our Christian assumptions, doesn't it? Like for que one question, is God in control? I, and when I say that, what I'm saying is, has he determined our outcomes and behaviors of individuals in creation, right? There's something very um, beautifully naive and relaxing to say, oh man, there's all this stuff going on, but God's in control, isn't it? Like, it's like a, it's just like the, oh, it's okay. It's like, mom's going to clean it up. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like, kitchen's a mess. Oh, just throw it in the sink. Mom's going to do the dishes. Like, or dad. Or, or dad. That's in my household. Thank you very much. Am I right? Can I get an amen from my wife? She's saying amen. Yes! Woohoo! All right, we're going to close in prayer. I'm going. I got a win today. That's the point though, right? So the point is, we have this theology that oftentimes makes us feel comfortable, but it's not biblical. Okay, so what am I getting at? What I'm saying is, um, I believe God has allowed for creation to exist in loving relationship. This is my theology of God. God himself exists in a loving relationship with himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then he creates humanity to live in perfect loving relationship with him, with each other, and all creation. This is the, the design of creation and that was distorted because of evil and sin and death. But that's God's design. But love always empowers choice. Like if you're in a relationship that is controlling, that's not love. Like you think that I raise my kids to where they're 18 wondering if, I, if I'll brush their teeth and dress them for the day? I would have failed as a father. Just relate to the, the image, the relationship. Imagine my 28-year-old son FaceTiming me before his day at the office. What do you think about these slacks, dad? You're like, that man messed up. 
both failed. It's not love, right? It's not God's intention to control. Love creates freedom. Love empowers the ability to love back. Love empowers you to go your own way. And that love will chase you all the way down, but not to control you, but that so you can flourish in the way you were designed to exist. So with that in mind, I think that God empowers love. He empowers choice. He empowers free will. And this, by the way, let me just say this. This is why so many people don't believe in the Christian God, because they have the wrong view of God. How can a loving God let bad things happen to people? How can a loving God allow for evil? How can a loving God allow Faith and Josh to struggle for two and a half years with infertility? If he's good, if he's all loving, and he's all powerful, these are the questions that we have to wrestle with. And the easy answer isn't, well, God's in control. I don't know. He's beyond, you know, he's beyond my, that's not, I don't think that's fair. I think a, a biblical answer is to say, he's grieving with them. He's weeping with them. This was never his desire in creation. How do we know that? Genesis 1 and 2, Jesus' entire life, the entire Old and New Testament, and then Revelation 21 and 22. How do we know? The Bible! He's on a loving mission to restore. One day, I was just telling Ezra on a walk the other day, one day there will be no more tears. There will be no more pain. There will be no more evil. There will be no terrorist attacks. There'll be no hate. There will be no racism. There will be no sicknesses. There will be nothing but perfection and humanity whole. And we will be in a loving relationship with God. There will be no secrets. There will be no lies. There will be no self-harm. None of that will exist. This is the story we're telling. We live in the reality of Jesus has come, ushering in his way of life, and that world is contested by evil power, and one day it will be forever fulfilled in Christ, and we will all be restored. This is our story. And so as followers of Jesus, we need to understand that God is good, and he's sovereign. He's in charge. He has ultimate power power and authority over all things created in heaven and on earth. He is supreme. He's in charge, but he's not determining all the little things. And so when, when sin is evident, when evil is evident, when death comes prematurely, he grieves. I believe that with all my heart. I've done memorial services this year. He grieves the loss. He welcomes them in heaven. He embraces and celebrates, but he grieves the loss. He didn't need an angel in heaven for the softball game because he's in control. Do you hear me? Too much damage is happening. Let's get our theology right. He is so good, he is all loving, and he is longing like you for those things to be different. And maybe he's waiting on your prayers. Maybe he's waiting on the church to pray so that bowl will fall in Revelation, it will be poured out and then, and then it happens. Do you see that? This is Revelation, how we, oh, you're like, wait, what, Revelation? Yeah, there's a bowl of tears and prayers being collected by the saints of God. And one day their prayers are gonna pour it over and then judgment, yes, judgment and, and vindication and love and grace and the, the, the beginning of a new era beco becomes through Jesus. How are we doing church? Are we awake? Old Testament assumes the presence of invisible spiritual beings like human beings clearly have a mind and a will of their own and they can choose to work with God or against God. All right, let's, let's go through the New Testament real quick because we're gonna focus a whole sermon on this with Jesus next week. But to understand a major theme of the New Testament is to understand a clash between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of Satan. And the climax of human history is actually Jesus on the cross. And Jesus on the cross, Jesus defeats and overpowers Satan, frees the human race from Satan dominion, de, de, Satan's dominion, uh, frees humanity from death's grip and sin. We'll look at this next week. A couple of passages just to highlight. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says to the church, anyone, anyone you forgive, I also forgive. 
And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. This is a specific conflict in the church. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Let me just say this to the church. Satan's trap is unforgiveness. Paul, is, it makes it clear. I don't have time to go into this. But one of the ways Satan will trap you in despair, isolate you from relationships, is unforgiveness. So if you're here and you're holding on for unforgiveness, you are being played like an instrument by Satan. How's that sound? Do you want to be this Satan's violin today? I hope not. Unforgiveness is a trap. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, the weapons we fight are not weapons of the world. On contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take, every, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. He's specifically talking about strongholds, narratives, ideas, ideologies that oppose Christ oppose God's way of life. And our task as the church is to not let one thought go into our head that's not captive and submitted to Jesus. Because the enemy comes in and he will build a cathedral of lies in your mind. And they will become manifested physically in your life. I believe that. I've experienced it myself. 1 Peter chapter 5 says, Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, in case you didn't know, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. Over and over again, we see throughout the New Testament this emphasis on the, Satan's opposition to God's way of life. Are we aware? We're not talking about scary movies. We're talking about the reality of God doing something in your life. and that There's an enemy working against that good thing God's trying to do. Ephesians which Bill will talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, chapter six, verse 10, it says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Verse 12 says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Paul in the series that we'll do on Ephesians, we'll talk about this more. But Paul wants the church to know that as it engages prophetically in the world, that there is a devil, the Satan, there is evil force, evil forces that are working against the church. And our task is not to seek them out. All we have to do is turn on the light. Remember, darkness flees from light. Our task is to stand firm against the attacks. The question is, are you standing firm? I like to say, is your life worthy of opposition? Paul's arguing that Christians must remain faithful to Christ to remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, authorities, powers in this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So Paul says that there are spiritual realities working against God's way of life. And then he gives these categories. And I don't think they're, they're like, you know, specific, like should be on an Excel spreadsheet. I think he's giving language to things going on. Let me say, there are personal evil beings, demons. There are impersonal evil forces, and there are suprapersonal spiritual forces. There are demons and follow angel, fallen angels. And then there are cosmic entities, powers, authorities, forces that have influence over nations, governments, generations, countries, cities, communities, and culture. And they can influence both the individual and culture on global scale and on the micro scale. Global scale being systemic issues like poverty, uh, slavery, human trafficking, racism, forced labor, hunger. These are forms of injustice that are against the way of God. Now, some of you are like, well, that's just the result of, of human choice. Yes, and evil is working in that. Are you with me? We can't just equate it to this will be fixed just by social justice. We are powerless to the evil forces on our own strength. 
Let me pause. I feel like I'm just dropping so much. Are you guys all right? Yes. I'll close in just a second. Are you feeling all right? Yes. Okay. I'm going to give you some tools to walk away so you don't feel overwhelmed today. But next week, we're going to talk about Jesus and specifically his ministry of deliverance. The following week is uh, Alex and Hannah Absalom, and they're going to talk about it, and they're going to do our training as well on deliverance ministry. And then the following week after that will be Bill, and then I'll be back to talk some more. But here's the thing. I, when, when Paul says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, he's talking about spiritual warfare. And I just want to, I want to camp on this for a moment. <laughs> spiritual warfare almost always feels like flesh and blood. Spiritual opposition can manifest emotionally, mentally, physically, or relationally. Spiritual opposition. Now, we're going to speak specifically about can Christians be demonized, so come next week. I'll talk to you about that. Hold you on your, your feet to be continued. But the, here's how the enemy comes at you, all right? So the enemy's going to come at you personally. And what we, we see this in the scripture. He comes after Jesus, and he comes after, first thing he's going to do is bring you false narratives. He's, gonna, he's called the father of lies, so he's going to bring lies to you. He's going to attack your identity, He's going to attack you with accusations. He's going to try to make you feel shame. Remember, guilt from the Holy Spirit is not a bad thing. It's I've done something bad. I've done something wrong. Shame is I am bad. And that's the enemy's tactic to keep you paralyzed in your sin, to keep you paralyzed in a false identity. So the enemy will come at you with false narratives and lies. He'll come at you um, and attack your self-worth. He'll begin to distort your value uh, and your sense of value. He'll come at you with fear. He'll cause you to focus on the things that are frightening. He'll get you to become anxious. Because if you're anxious, your body will naturally produce worry. And when you're anxious and worried, it's very hard to trust in God. When you go in an ecosystem of fear, when you live in an ecosystem of fear, it produces a sense of control. But what God wants you to do is live in an ecosystem of love, which love will produce trust and faith and, and, and push fear to the side. The third thing the enemy will do is bring temptation. He knows what you struggle with. He, he, he's like AI, right? He, he's like your phone. It knows you better than yourself. Studying your eye movement, studying the, he's like, he's like Siri and Alexa and AI all into one. And he's using those things, seriously, to tempt you. That's why late at night when you're scrolling through Instagram, you get that thing that pops up. For some of you, it's the, it's the Amazon purchase. Others of you, it's lust. That's why when you're feeling down emotionally or you're just hungry, and you know that if you stop at that one store, place, you're going to get lots of food. And if you eat that kind of food, you're going to go to bed early or you're going to, watch, you're going to check out on Netflix or you're going to get, have a second, third glass of whatever that is because you earned it. You see, the enemy will tempt you in your unique ways. And you got to pay attention. To, that's the enemy's scheme. He's going to tempt you with sin. He's going to tempt you first with distraction. If he can't get you to fail, he'll tempt you with success. If he can't get you to shut up, he'll tempt you with a megaphone. If he, he'll tempt you with busyness. Fourth, he'll attack your physical health. It's hard for me to say this one because I don't want to go there. But yeah, when you look at the, the New Testament and the ministry of Jesus, a lot of healing is connected to de uh, demonization. So healing is someone being exercised and then they're healed of physical conditions. We have so many accounts in the Old Testament or in the New Testament and historical accounts as well. And this is where we, we have a struggle with it. But I believe that one of the reasons we want to engage in deliverance ministry, and I'm not, I'm not talking about demons screaming in our services, although that might happen. I'm talking about healing. The ministry of Jesus is setting captives free. We live in a world of prisoners and the church is the only place that can set those people free. Some of you are actually imprisoned. In fact, I would say the place where we're going to find the most demons is right here in the church. So we got to get good at learning how to deal with them. He's going to come at you with sickness and physical ailments and all sorts of issues. Lord knows our family knows that. He's going to come at you with relationship issues. He's going to cause you to isolate from relationships. He's going to come at miscommunication. One of the things I pray for regularly is our communication in my marriage because the enemy loves to use that, right? He's already, he already has me with temper. 
So if we have miscommunication, the temper comes, and then it goes towards something else, and then it goes towards something else. Next thing you know, we're disconnected. Anyone want to say amen? Yeah. You're like, wait, is this spiritual? I, yeah, hey, I don't know, but it's, all things are spiritual. So why not cover your bases? He'll come at you with bitterness and unforgiveness. He'll come at your marriages with mis- miscommunication, pettiness, arguments, unfaithfulness, lust, sins. He'll, he'll come at you with the scoreboard comparison game. I love to play that one. <laughs> and when you play his games, you're used as his tool. And rather than being a servant to my wife, I become a tool of the enemy towards my wife and I diminish her. He'll come at you with the silent killer in your marriage. Roommates. He'll make you roommates. And you'll get content being roommates as lovers. Rather than lovers, you just become coexisting in the same place, co-parenting. And you lose the very thing, this miracle of two becoming one. And I believe the enemy's done that in our church. And we're going to see healing. We're going to see breakthrough. If you're single, he's going to come at you with not feeling like God can use you until you're married. That's a lie. He's going to come at you like the lie that marriage is your goal for singles. That's, that's a lie. That's the idol of marriage. This is all lie. He'll come at you with loneliness. He'll come at you with uh, inadequacy, isolation, feeling left out. If, if you have kids, he'll come at you... There's so many ways he's going to come at you. But for this series, I just want to say, there are spiritual forces working against you who, and, and spiritual forces working to destroy and oppose God's way of life within us and around us. So we must stand firm knowing our battle is not flesh and blood. It may feel like flesh and blood, but it's not against flesh and blood. So we must learn to live and operate with this awareness and through prayer, putting on the armor of God, stand firm, moving towards God's way of life forward. So the invitation is to walk in faith, to pray, to read scripture, to join Christian community, to remember who you are in Christ, get rid of ongoing sin and resist the temptation, forgive and release those who you're holding unforgiveness towards, take your thoughts captive and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so this is part one of a long story. We're gonna, we're gonna do a lot of stuff to get you equipped in the theology of warfare, but I want you to walk out of here knowing that you're called to engage as followers in this battle that's going on by living the way of Jesus. And I want you to be aware of it. So just begin to pray against these things. So let's stand.